Uh, now I have the pri privilege of introducing a panel with four legislators who were instrumental in getting Oregon's transportation, pa pass tra transportation package passed this year. Uh, Jessica Gomez, CEO of Rogue, Rogue Valley Micro Devices, uh, is going to talk to them about how they were able to achieve success on transportation and what lessons we can learn for solving the budget crisis. Uh, please welcome Senators Lee Beyer, Brian Boquist, and Representative, Representatives Cliff Bentz and Caddy McEwen. Oh, I like that. I'm on the left. <laughs> you good? Thank you. Aw, oh, how sweet. <laughs> what a gentleman. Thank you, Senator. There are a few nice people in the Senate. <laughs> So thank you so much for being here. Uh, we have known for a long time that Oregon's been in need of a transportation package. And we also knew that it was going to take some uh, pretty big bipartisan solutions to get that done, and a lot of stakeholder involvement throughout the state, from rural going through uh, urban. Um, and you guys were able to get that done, and, and you did an amazing job. Let's give them a hand. <laughs> Yeah, at a time when national politics have become really polarized, I think we really wanted to um, talk with you and learn about what your process was and how you were able to um, move this forward. So, Representative Benz, what was that like? How did you develop the process? Um, what were some of the strategies that uh, your team used in order to bring this together? Well, I, I think uh, it would be difficult for me to take credit for designing the team that was done by, by our leadership, uh, uh, Speaker Kotek and uh, President of the Senate, Peter Courtney. Um, so it would be hard for me to say that I brought the team together. But I will say that having the right people at the table is a huge part of, of getting anything done. I, will, I would also say that uh, it's absolutely essential that you have the support of, of leadership, because if you don't have your speaker and your governor and, uh, and the president of the Senate going in the same direction, it's a huge waste of time. And fortunately, uh, they, were, they were going in the same direction. Uh, without that leadership part, though, it's, it's uh, no use even, even getting started. But we, it also helped that this was really uh, the, fourth, the fourth year of working on this problem. It also helped that th the nature of the problem is defined in, in, in a sense. You don't have to spend much time discussing what the problem really is. And, and that's, if we we're going to, going to compare this to the issue that's before everyone right now, there are probably 50 definitions of the nature of the problem when it comes to funding and spending and PERS. So if you sit down and say, hey, if you're going to start out to solve this problem, you would ask the person, well, what is the problem? And you're going to get 50 different answers. So this, the, the transportation package is quite different uh, in many respects because of the defined nature of the issue as compared to what we're facing now. So it sounds like um, that having that definitive problem um, was really important um, to kind of coming together. What was the process like for um, bringing the stakeholders involved and, and how, what was that like for you? What did you learn during that process? Well, keep in mind that we, as Representative Betts said, we started this process four years ago in the legislature, but it was really important that Governor Brown's transportation vision panel went around the state and had a good discussion, and we followed that up with 11 public hearings across the state with the legislature. And it wasn't just our committee, we had other members of the legislature who weren't on the committee that would join us on many of those, and so it was some pretty good discussions. and. Uh, we actually got pretty similar messages in each of the places we went. So it, it built a really good basis for coming to a decision. And then the, the, obviously, at the end of the day, there was a, a far bigger appetite than what we could afford, but we ended up getting a pretty good package that I think made most people happy. Yeah, they were here earlier talking about we needed to um, think about billions, right? Not just a one or two billion dollar package. And, um, you know, I heard that as well uh, at the beginning of um, sort of session as we were looking at, um, you know, is this, are we going to be able to get a package uh, done? 
What, did you notice um, b differences, uh, big differences between what uh, rural uh, folks were interested in and versus um, what was important to people in the uh, urban areas as you kind of collected that information? Uh, <clears throat> in a way, no. Um, I think transportation is unique in that uh, it's, 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 a, it's a system that all connects up. Mm -hmm. So when we did our, our road show and went to visit 11 communities that were very urban and very rural in all parts of the state, and I'll, I'll step back and give our leadership credit for designing a 14-member committee that was geographically very diverse. So on the committee, there was an understanding of the differences between urban and rural needs. Mm -hmm. But what we kept hearing at these meetings was the issue of... Uh, of course, preservation and maintenance of the existing system was critical. We need to take care of the roads, bridges, and culverts that we have. Um, and, and we were losing ground, so that was a really important piece. But secondarily, whether we were urban or rural, we heard about the importance of congestion in the metro area and the impact it has on freight mobility and on the economy of the state. So that was something that we heard everywhere we went. Mm -hmm. uh, and the issue around transit was something that we heard everywhere that we went as well. Mm -hmm. Whether we were in um, Newport or Medford or over east, whether it's a large transit organization or a very small rural transit organization, the connectivity of that was a really important issue that kept coming up over and over as well. So it sounds like a lot of consensus, uh, which is, I think, going to be a very different situation when we talk about uh, the budget-related um, crisis that, that is happening all over. Um, Senator Bocrest, you know, we, I think we know what the cost drivers are, or at least some of them, um, you know, and our budget is, in a lot of ways, our spending is not in alignment with our ability to generate revenue. How would you go about applying some of the methods and some of the process that you learned during, during the, putting together the transportation package and apply it to uh, building bipartisan solutions for resolving some of the budget-related issues that we have today? Let me step back, I guess, and go back to <clears throat> the original transportation. Transportation is an interesting issue, and I think, as Representative Bentz pointed out, it's, it's separate. We have a different constitutional funding mechanism. Uh, the whole transportation concept for nationwide and, and interstate highways started in the late 50s, actually, in the Defense Department, and Eisenhower actually envisioned this almost as early as World War I. And so that structure and that problem set is pretty easy to define. Uh, the question comes back is, how do you put the leadership together? And I think the key way going forward and the key success that I see um, <clears throat> that came from the transportation that would work in every way going forward in terms of, re of revenue generation <clears throat> in the future is that leadership. You've got to have the speaker and the president have got to appoint people who um, are, are willing to do the work Every organization that's out there in the business community knows you got 10% of the achievers and then another group of people, and us in the military, we call them lurkers, shirkers, workers, so on and so forth like that. And so the, the bottom line here is you got to have the right leadership team. And if, if that leadership team, those four people, can't work together, <clears throat> um, we wouldn't have had a transportation package. Now, the answer to your question here, which is really the key thing going forward, and everybody's sitting here because we're looking at a federal tax policy, we're looking at whatever changes happen in Oregon, and as you have said, cost drivers and spending. <clears throat> Everything is really a revenue issue um, in terms of going forward. The key components of that, though, are education funding and education reform. Are those cost drivers the right wing as education? The second piece is then the healthcare piece, and are the cost drivers in healthcare, because healthcare will probably will exceed by 2021 the expenses that we're seeing in the education community. And then the third piece is I'm going to call public compensation and try and keep away from the PERS red herring. So in the future, folks, start talking public compensation so we can get everybody calmed down around the table. <clears throat> those three pieces that are there, to integrate those together, you're going to have to have a pretty, a pretty um, focused team of leadership of legislators going to do it because you cannot do any of those pieces singly. And the reason being is, is even if you passed one reform and put a tax on it and got it out of the building, in theory, it would be on the ballot in 29 seconds. So what we did, and this is the, the process that we used in, in the transportation, is, is the four of us helped frame that 
And then we actually got away from using subcommittees like they do in the Ways and Means process and went to work groups. And the reason we went to work groups and we each agreed, I drew this short straw, got one of the worst work groups. That's what happens when you're a minority. <laughs> uh, is you, that work group is you can get those stakeholders in the room and you can continue to work through those issues in, and I don't want to say a bipartisan, but in a nonpartisan way. I mean, I even forced the, the Statesman Journal and the Tribune to answer questions in the work groups too when they were there because you're in the work group, you're going to, it's part of this process. And then the other thing is that the members, the leadership team that's put together to do that has to have, as was said before, the speaker and the president uh, giving them 100% support. And at least on the Senate side, we, we had carte blanche on the Senate side. You, know, you come back with a plan that you can put together because you can forget really Transportation did not boil down this way, <clears throat> and I don't think a future way of addressing the cost drivers in these three areas simultaneously, or at least two or three at the same time, and then figuring out whether you do need some sort of you know, revenue package. I don't think that will, um, <clears throat> those can be successful uh, unless you, again, have that right leadership team that's there and that you're willing to get everybody to work together. I mean, I will tell you from my perspective, having been enslaved for, the, for two years with my colleagues here, and I've heard every argument known to man from Representative Bent, so I actually get along with him fine now. Uh, <laughs> doing that, you know, you have to have that time. I mean, we spent some days, three or four hours a day for six months, and then we spent 18 months together. And so, the, and that's how you have to build this. And we all reported back to each other. And when we didn't believe something in our work group was maybe correct, we'd ask another one of our colleagues here at this table to bounce it off their work group. And we got buy into this of what are the reforms that are out there that need to be done? What do we need to spend the money and how do we prioritize that? And that's sort of the way you would, would have to go forward. I, I think I could tell you in the first uh, two hours after those four people were appointed, if it were a joint committee, whether it would succeed or fail. And I might add that yeah. <clears throat> I think Senator Boquist is correct. The makeup of the group is really important, and that commitment that is made early on from leadership is very important. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't want to discount the work that the stakeholders put into this as well. Every Monday and Wednesday night for two hours, these work groups met for three and a half months. And a lot of the people in this audience were down in Salem in a night meeting two nights a week to make sure that their voices were heard as well, and having those voices there was critical to our success. Uh, and, and I guess I would also say don't discount when the going gets tough, and the four of us were reaching a point where things were going a bit awry. Uh, the beauty of a bowl of peanut M&Ms, some Cheetos, and an adult beverage now and then <laughs> um, was helpful in keeping a conversation going. Um, but it's camaraderie and it's trust and it's respect among the people at the table that is also very important. Uh, I, that's I, would, great. I would add to that that what was perhaps different is when the leadership appointed the four of us. I mean, it's the traditional chair and vice chair, and the first thing we did is said, there are, there are four co-chairs here. We're going to work together and we reach a consensus on it. And we had an agreement that we were going to turn out a plan. And we didn't always agree on everything, but we worked through it. And we spent a lot of time, just the four of us, you know, hidden in the basement, trying to figure out how to balance what was coming out of the four work groups. But there was a real commitment. We each took one of those work groups of stakeholders that uh, uh, Caddy was talking about. It. And those, were, those took a lot of time. I mean, you're talking every Monday and every Wednesday for two and a half to three hours. Uh, pretty good, and, and we all kind of chuckled about uh, Senator Boquist, military style. No one could stay in the room unless they contributed. <laughs> <laughs> he went around the table each time, and if you didn't talk, you were out of the room. <laughs> well, thank you for, you know, kind of describing what that was like, because I think so many people don't realize how hard legislators work on some of these really, really big issues. I, you know, you mentioned enslavement and M&Ms and adult beverages and the hours and hours of time it takes to really work through those um, big issues as you're getting lots of information coming from you from all, all over. How important is, would you say is the um, ability uh, for stakeholders to be part of that process? Um, what kind of... Uh, 
coordination or collaboration do you feel is most helpful in your work? How can we best support you as um, Oregon citizens, as business owners? Uh, we really need these problems to be solved, and, and you're the, 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 the people that we have that are uh, going to be moving this forward. How can we best support you? Let me take a shot at that. We, the, the, the phrase I like is the recognition of the reality of power. It's a great phrase. And if we're going to start down this road, you have to recognize who has to be at that table to make it actually happen. Uh, there's lots of folks that will talk generally about how wonderful this or that would be while ignoring the elephants in the room. And that, that won't work. You, you have to call each one of them out, and we've heard many of their names in, in previous panels this morning. But you, you cannot steer around any of those large obstacles to ultimately getting something done. So they have to be recognized at the very front end, and they have to be brought to the table, and they have to be called out. And until people are willing to do that, nothing's going to happen. And uh, I mean, lots will happen, but uh, you know, as you say, a lot will be said, uh, but very little will be done. And so recognize who it is that has to be at the table and make sure they're, uh, they're, they're, they're listened to. One other thing, this uh, concept of, of uh, all of us getting along, uh, we didn't. And, uh, and it, there was a, a huge amount of, uh, shall we say, very clear discussion in this group of four here. That doesn't lend itself to transparency, because in, in the large group of 14, you can't call Brian Boquist some of the things he was called down in the basement. And so... Uh, <laughs> I thought I called you. The basement. <laughs> yeah, just saying. So the, how one structures this, uh, whether it's open and transparent as you report in, and then you retreat to go negotiate, but in some fashion, you have to have that clarity of discussion, or you won't get this kind of job done. Mm -hmm. but, but the idea of having stakeholders involved, I think that's good government, getting people involved in what they, wanna, what they want out of the system. We knew as a reality on transportation, and I think this is probably true on general revenue, that in our case there were three groups of key stakeholders who any one of the three, if they were unhappy, could have put something on the ballot. So it was trying to not only get us to agree, but get them to balance their concerns as well. Because uh, you put it on the belt and it's dead. And I think that's true of anything. That's the toughest thing on any revenue measure. One is it, it takes a supermajority to get it out of the legislature. And then you have to have stickiness so that it doesn't end up on the ballot. That's just a reality of the discussion. And you, I, I would say to stakeholders, you can't sit on the sidelines and favor your issue without being able to recognize the other side and do some accommodation. It just won't work otherwise. Yeah. I think I'd add also a word that hasn't come up in this discussion yet that came up a great deal as we were moving forward with the package, and that is everybody had to have skin in the game. Um, all the stakeholders, legislators, um, caucuses, all of the factions, um, the, the, the word kept coming up that, that everybody had to have some skin in the game. If you want something out of this package, you have to be willing to contribute to the package. And I think that was an important concept that uh, everybody had to give a little to get something. And I think that was a really um, interesting way to approach this. That's what we kept putting out when we had our public meetings across the state. People would come and testify at our public hearings and say, well, we want this, 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 and this. Our question back to them was then, how would you like to participate in paying for that? So we had an open dialogue during our road trips about how you want to participate. A lot of people wanted a lot, but they didn't really have ideas. They wanted us to figure out how to pay for it. Right. So then we were, <laughs> no, how do you want to pay for that? If this is something you care about, how do you want to participate in that? And what we ended up with was a pretty innovative package that really held people accountable to that idea. Yeah. I, I think yeah, Representative Mintz raised an excellent point, and that is, is that once the, the four of us going back and forth came up with what I call from the military side, all these courses of action, mm -hmm. you had to go back, as my other two colleagues here to the right said, is, is you have to go back to stakeholders. And here's how the participation needs to work if we were going to do something much grander and three times more difficult. And that is, is they've got to be prepared to participate both at a committee level, uh, both at a work group level, 
at both at an individual level. And here's the key thing right here is, is you can't come and pontificate with PowerPoint slides or you can't come to a work group and say, well, this is our position. You have to come with some responsibility to say, okay, this is your position, you know, where's the flexibility here? How can we work and integrate this stuff? And you have to be prepared to do it at a moment's notice. I mean, this is like business. I mean, in business entities out there, if the market changes or there's a crisis or there's an accident in the company or something like that, things happen instantaneously. And that was the key thing that worked well in transportation processes is we would have a change and we'd find a fit and the four of us would go back out to our stakeholder groups. And mind you, I had 25 people minimum in my work group at least two dozen, several dozen times. And so trying to communicate with 25 people very quickly is difficult. But you can't say, well, I'll get back to you next week. As this process moved along, there were critical junctures in it in which uh, the governor had to step in and help, various stakeholder groups had to step in and help and use peer pressure to kind of move it forward. Um, and if you think transportation is hard, these three key points that you're really driving at, which is, you know, is there a revenue spending issue? What is the reforms needed to better finance education if, that's the, if that is the outcome? Same thing with health care and then this public compensation. Those are really challenging <coughs> tasks. You know, I, I I would add to that, you know, I've, I'm sitting here thinking, listen to this, and I remember being here last year and some folks, I think it was Duncan, some other stuff, said, well, the legislature's going to solve the revenue problem. <laughs> My response is, no, they're not. <laughs> You're going to solve the revenue problem and the legislature is going to accept it. And I think that's, that's probably a little over-dramatization, but you'll never get a revenue or a spending problem taken care of unless there's agreement in the broader Oregon community about what they want done. Thank you. I, you know, I can't help but think about when I was sort of preparing for this, you, you look at these really, really big um, issues that we're grappling with and you try to think about how is this going to be tackled in the future? How are we going to support a process um, where we can really all come around the table and You've done such a great job, and I hear, you know, little snippets of how we might be able to kind of design a process or how a process might might work in this instance. And it was interesting, Senator Bocas, that you mentioned that you can't really look at these uh, things as individual issues. You have to really look at them as a system. And I think that's a really important distinction for um, many of the stakeholders that are involved, because we all, you know, we look at these big issues and we say, you know, we really need um, our piece of it fixed. We need someone to help on the finance side for education and healthcare and all of these uh, really big systems need to be kind of coordinated. Uh, it, that is really tough to do. And then you need business and individual people to step up on the, on the revenue side. I, I just give you so much credit for, for really um, being thoughtful about what that looks like. How do you feel like the personal relationships um, play into your ability to be successful? Well, well they're, abso they're yeah. absolutely essential. And, and, and it's not just the relationships with the four folks up here. It's, it's all of those interest groups and it's is that governor person and it's that speaker of the house and it's that president of the senate and it's and it's is the chair of every uh, organization that's in play all of those relationships are are terrifically important there's a, <clears throat> a give and take in each in these negotiations it can't be all give in other words we're not going to go out and raise taxes by three billion dollars and fix the problem because it's not going to happen there's going to have to be a trade-off and you have to work your way into those problems with an understanding of them and that takes you directly to the people who know those kind of things. And that takes you directly into trust and it takes you directly into history and takes you into how loudly did I yell at uh, Senator Beyer here, is he actually going to listen to me next time? I mean, all of that kind of uh, uh, interplay is uh, terrifically important. I think it's, go back to what I said before. I could tell you, if you picked four people and you were going to put all three of these future problems in a basket, I could tell you in the first two hours, and I only say that because I don't know all the House members, I apologize, is I have to look a little bit at that, but I could tell you whether it's work because it's exactly what you just said, and that is it's the interpersonal relationship. Can those people work together? And remember, you don't have to work, agree. And we certainly did not agree at times between the four of us, and sometimes there were six opinions between four of us. And so 
That is the key thing, that interpersonal relationship, and then exactly as Representative Ben said, and once the four of you come to some series of consensus and how we sort of did it, and I go back to using courses of actions, we came up with two or three scenarios, if, if it's a better term, you don't like we're courses of action, and then we had to go out with those interpersonal relationships and, and move it across. The legislature, people say all politics is local, but you get things done in the legislative process and in the business community, let's just face reality, on who you know and what your relationship is with them. And that is critical to develop those stakeholders. That's why it took us 18 months to come up with a transportation plan, because I didn't know anything about transportation, as far as I'm concerned. And so that is the absolute number one key point that you pointed out, and that is, is those interpersonal relationships that will have to be developed in whether those four or five people or whoever the key group in that committee as a whole, if that's the way you're going. Well, keep in mind that focus is on the four of us, but it wasn't the four of us that passed the bill. Yeah. There was a large committee, 14 member committee, that was equally that we were working with the membership <clears throat> there and the leadership constantly through the process because at the end of the day, my goal, what I said when we were going in is we're gonna pass a bill, not with the minimum majority, but we were gonna get 40 votes in the House and 20 in the Senate. And the leadership said, that's crazy, you'll never get that. We ended up with 19, or excuse me, with 39 in the House and 23 in the Senate mm -hmm. on a revenue bill. But that's because we worked with everybody and addressed the concerns, not all of the concerns, but at least people felt like they were heard. And that was not just the legislature, but also the stakeholders group. And we forced them to accept some things and saying, if you want that, you have to accept this. So it's, it's a large, large discussion. And you have to listen. The important thing is you have to listen and try to address what the citizenry wants. Right. Keep in mind that this was really almost a four-year ramp up because we went through this process in the 15th session and we failed. But there was a lot of groundwork that was laid during that time when we were preparing the proposal during that session. Uh, then the new committee was formed in a different fashion, and we went out and did our trips around the state. The governor had the vision panel work that was done. So this was a really long ramp up to the success of this process. So there was a, there was a lot that went into it. And I would add to that. One of the reasons I think it failed in 15 was we tried to do it in a small group mm. behind closed doors rather than doing an open process. And if I might join in, the, 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 the issue of time is hugely important. We had way too little time in 015. We were tried to cram it all into basically 40 days. There was no way. The, and, and that time piece is so huge for the interest groups because people, if, if I go to a union and say, surprise, you're going to tell everybody this is how it's going to be, the union's going to say, no, no, we're not. We need to go back and sell this to our membership, and that's going to take a while. And so you don't just come in and spring anything on anybody. You start out early, and you work your way through it from the, from the ground up. So we're about out of time. And speaking of the time component, how are you feeling about 2019? Do you think that we're going to be able to get there? Pass a revenue package? I think it's hard. Okay. Mm. It's a different animal than a transportation package. Yeah. No I'm comments? Not very, I'm, <laughs> I'm not very optimistic, <laughs> but I mean, having said that, my wife says I'm darkest before it's pitch black, so it doesn't mean you don't try, I guess. That's right. <laughs> you got to try. <laughs> yes. I, I would just say if, you, if you're going to do something in 19, we should have started uh, six or eight months ago. Okay. It's time. Well, thank you. Thank you so very much for being here and being on the hot seat. Uh, we really appreciate it. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senators, Representatives, and Jessica. We all have a lot to learn from your success, and we appreciate the thoughts and advice on how we might proceed on the budget issue.